Welcome to Data Byte 142. I'm Amanda Lenhart. I'm the program director for health and data at Data and Society. I'll be your host for today alongside the DNS events team behind the Zoom, Rigo, uh, CJ, and Eli. For those of you who don't know us yet, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary multi thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology and society. This event was co is co-produced with our friends at the Ada Lovelace Institute in London, England. Uh, their current research on COVID-19 technologies and particularly on vaccine passports is what is underpinning this event today. The Ada Lovelace Institute is a research institute and deliberative body dedicated to ensuring that data and AI work for people and society. To learn more about their work, visit adalovelaceinstitute.org. So we'll be spending the hour together, so let's get grounded. Data and Society began in Lenapahoking, a network of hills, rivers, and islands in the Atlantic Northeast known as New York City. This land is the ancestral home of the Leni Lenape people. Today, we are connected online via the internet, a vast interplanetary array of data servers and computer devices. In the United States, much of this system sits on stolen land acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we recognize this truth and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory. We commit to dismantling all ongoing colonial practices and their material implications in our digital worlds. The website nativeland.ca is an ongoing mapping of indigenous land rights and territories. This is a tool for you to learn about the land you are on. Please feel free to share where you are joining us from in the Q&A. So today we are asking what place should COVID-19 vaccine, COVID vaccine passports have in society? Which is also, helpfully, the title of the Ada Lovelace report that is anchoring our talk today. Joining me to unpack the findings are three expert voices in the field. First, my co-host Imogen Parker, who's the Associate Director at Ada Lovelace Institute uh, for Policy and a Policy Fellow at Cambridge University's Center for Science and Policy. Ranjit Singh, a postdoctoral scholar on Data and Society's AI on the Ground team. And Amy Fairchild, a historian, public health ethicist, and Dean of the School of Public Health at Ohio State University. For the sake of time, you can read extended speaker bios in the events page linked in the chat. So Imogen, let's get started by setting the stage a bit. What are we talking about when we talk about vaccine passports? Thanks so much, Amanda. And it's a real pleasure to, to work with you and to be here for this conversation. Uh, so just to set the scene a little bit, there are lots of different terms circulating and lots of different versions of what we might include under this umbrella heading of a vaccine passport. I think to anchor today's conversation and the, the work that Ada has been looking at over the last year has really been focusing on tools that have three parts. It brings together health information, so that might be vaccine results, uh, sorry, vaccine records, it might be test results, it might be health or risk factors around COVID. It links that information with some form of identity information, so to connect that health record to an individual, it might be a digital ID system, might be a biometric scan, might be a passport number, for example. And then that composite is shared through a digital platform to a third party who uses that to make a decision at an individual level about access or the ability to access rights or freedom. So the sorts of topics that are, you know, come up often in this debate around international travel, for example, having to show a vaccine passport to board a plane or domestic uses like being able to go to the cinema or into indoor spaces. And since, you know, the, the idea of an, an immunity passport, a vaccine passport, COVID passport, has really been something that has been raised repeatedly since really early on in the pandemic. So we've been monitoring this from April last year. We've heard governments proposing ideas about really organizing differential rights and freedoms to individuals who face less risk from the pandemic. And it's worth just taking a minute to think about what the motivations might be for that, what the hope, <laughs> the hope of this might be. And, and you can really see this compelling case that rather than the heavy handed lockdowns we've been having that affect everyone that cause massive economic harm, massive social harm. Uh, you, an immunity passport or a vaccine passport might allow a more granular understanding of risk and a more targeted approach to limiting freedoms. So 
I, I guess the hope for something like this might be you can do public health better, you can lower the risk of people doing frontline work, for example. You can increase personal liberty at the aggregate uh, because some people don't need to stay home because they don't really face as much risk. And of course, you can stimulate the economy by allowing partial reopening, for example. So th this has been discussed in various forms. It hasn't really taken off uh, really because of whether health, the, the um, evidence is around transmission until recently. And I think once we saw vaccines pass regulatory tests, once we saw that rollout beginning, the momentum around this has built really, really rapidly. And the focus has moved away from natural immunity or risk scoring, really lasering down into vaccines. You know, if you've had the vaccine, should that allow you to do something different? And if it does, how do we develop a system around that that can kind of create certification? Uh, and just before we get into the discussion, I'll just sketch some of the different drivers in this ecosystem. We've seen some really important driver, I think, from companies who are developing tools and standards around this in the expectation that they think this is going to be instrumental in countries and, and across the world. So we've been speaking to health app providers that are building functionality out to you know, more actively display the COVID vaccine element of the health record. We've been talking to our big digital ID companies, biometrics companies who are moving sideways and thinking, can we incorporate vaccine records into this? Um, there's really important collaborations as well. So I think a particular one to watch is IBM and Salesforce. They've developed a digital health pass as part of a work management tool. So the idea for that is that employees, customers, visitors, two businesses or two spaces can share vaccination and health records on smartphones. There's Commons Pass, which is developed with the World Economic Forum for International Travel. And you've got a number of collectives that are coming together saying we need to figure out standards around this. We need to we need to ensure we've got interoperability and that includes Microsoft and Oracle. So you've got some really kind of huge players in this space that are driving this. Well, that are kind of really exploring this and kind of trying to make the case for these types of tools. In terms of countries, um, particular advocates to watch, I suppose, as early movers, we've seen Greece and Israel uh, really pushing for this. So Israel has a very high vaccination rate. It's looking at this for internal domestic use, like hospitality, going to the cinema. Uh, Greece, I think the focus really is on entry into the country. You know, that's a country that relies a lot on tourism. So they're really looking hard at can we get away from a two week quarantine period that basically makes it impossible for people to come on, you know, come on shorter holidays. So they're looking around that. Um, in Europe in general, freedom of movement has been so important that this conversation crops up a lot around kind of whether or how this could be used. Um, I think another country that's worth mentioning just in, by way of introduction is Germany. They have a national ethics body and that was tasked last year to look at the ethics of this um, and they couldn't reach agreement. They needed an extended period of time and the, they reached agreement that it shouldn't happen now, but they were split as to whether or not it should or could happen in the future if you know the evidence around health evolved. So I think that's a really a kind of really fascinating example and just demonstrates the complexity around this. Um, a couple of other bits just to throw in by way of context. So um, I've, I've been looking to the US and actually even in really in the recent weeks where we've been talking with data and society about this event, so it feels like momentum is now suddenly building really sharply. So uh, yesterday, Walmart as I think the biggest US vaccine provider um, has thrown their backing behind some form of digital vaccination credentials, a health passport app. Some interesting states to watch are in New York, the governor's announced a pilot of the Excelsior Pass for use at Madison Square Gardens and the Barclay Center. I think Hawaii is piloting airports and travel use. California had a bill vetoed recently that would have looked at this. And I think Florida has a bill um, filed aiming to block discrimination on the basis of health status. So it feels like it's suddenly this conversation is really ramping up in the US context as well. And a, a last story, I think, just to close on by way of introduction, I saw the news that states, airlines and tech companies are really advocating for the Biden administration to develop some federal standards around this, that the concern is building that you're going to have a patchwork of unregulated, of unreliable, or just a very different tools trying to do different things using different information. And that's going to really exacerbate some of the risks that I think we're going to get onto shortly. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I hope that just kind of gives a bit of a sense of how this question has risen up the agenda. Great. 
Thank you, Imogen. That was a super helpful grounding in this in this topic for all of us. And actually, we're going to get to the panel, rest other panelists in a second. But I, I did want to ask you um, quickly if you would be able to walk us through sort of what are the findings that your expert deliberation what did they what did they conclude about what we should do? Yeah. So um, so we we convened a group of experts bringing together different disciplinary perspectives from you know human rights data immunology um amy as well who, who's joining us today i'm really grateful for that um and the conclusion that we got to was that at present it felt that there wasn't justification for domestic generalized use and there's a couple of bits i want to just pick apart in that positioning so i think the first point we need to grapple with is the health you know this has to be built on solid foundations when it comes to where the health evidence is and it felt like the big justification for the group was that sharing my vaccine status, um, the justification for that is that it has to tell you something about the risk I pose to you. It can't just be about the risk I face from COVID. And at present, we don't have a clear and general picture on transmission risk. And um, the kind of questions of how this interacts with mutations as well is particularly live. So of course, that's, that's, um, that evidence will keep evolving and, um, that that picture may change. And so we, we came, we wanted to explore a couple of potential opportunities. Um, and the opportunities I think are very bedded in the UK context. So the sense was that there is this narrow window where a vaccine passport might be helpful if it was grounded in the science. And that window feels like it's when you have a sizable chunk of the population that have had two vaccines, but you haven't yet reached mass vaccination and hopefully herd immunity within your country. Now, the, UA, the, the UK is in quite a unique position in that we are doing, we are moving very quickly in terms of vaccination. So the hope is that I think all adults have a vaccine, have offered a vaccine by September. The uptake's also been really high, so kind of into the 90% of people that are getting offered a vaccine. So that feels that um, although there, are, there is this window of opportunity, uh, it doesn't necessarily weigh against some of the really sizable risks that the group identified. So just to, to rattle through those, um, there are a number of immediate and a number of longer term risks. There was one that was around risks to the individual on the uses of this information. So will this be used for policing? Will this be used for employment, for insurance, for dating apps? You know, what are the actual use cases we're talking about here? And are they valid use cases? Are they controllable use cases? And I think a really important point to make at this point is, even the most privacy preserving technology can still be used in ways that perhaps open individuals up to a risk of harm. There's a kind of bigger layer there, which is looking at society. So what is this going to do at a societal level to different groups? Will it affect inequalities? Will some groups be particularly disadvantaged? You know, what about those in precarious employment, for example? How does this interact with other forms of discrimination or forms of over surveillance under some groups? So I think there's a really important point there to probe around vaccine hesitancy as well. How is this going to play out against groups where there is greater vaccine hesitancy? Then you can go up a greater level, which is looking at the global picture. And there were some real concerns about the global inequalities arising from this, and particularly whether this might risk supercharging a kind of vaccine nationalism or vaccine hoarding, which actually is not only bad for everyone, it's, it's also bad for, you know, bad for the countries where you're operating in. You know, there's this very clear argument coming out that we are only safe when we're all safe and actually we need to take this collective and this global approach. Two last points and then I'll hand back over. Um, there was a lot of discussion around whether this is normalizing a form of health status surveillance by creating this longer term infrastructure in response to a time bounded crisis. So some of the experts referenced the 9-11 security infrastructure at airports, this idea that once you build this pathway, which might feel justified in the midst of a pandemic, will it ever get stripped back? And if it doesn't, that takes on to a kind of another real concern that got raised, which is what are the longer term uses of this? What is the potential scope creep of this? Where might this expand to? Might it include things like HIV status, might it be used to check how often somebody was off ill in the last six months before employing? So I think all of those issues really need very serious consideration. And I think working through the kind of, is there an upside? Is it scientifically grounded? And if it is, can you put together the legal and the policy structures that can help to mitigate that both domestically, but also thinking internationally and globally? 
so yeah that's a that's a bit of a whistle stop tour of uh, of a lot of really rich conversation from our experts yeah oh well, that's brilliant thank you so much uh imogen that was a uh, really i think helpful and a great kickoff to the next part of our conversation and i i want to throw the sort of next question to amy which is you know having heard about some of these risks having heard about the uk's uh, sort of this this Ada Lovelace's um, you know UK based but more global look at this. What do we need to know about the U.S. context? What do we need to understand about how the United States is different, um, and how does that impact what a vaccine passport would even look like or do in this in this country? Thanks, Amanda. That's a really uh, important question to ask about the United States, where the different states are largely responsible for. Um, public health measures, and we we have seen very different approaches in the context of COVID-19, just to things like masking. Um, so we can imagine we'll see the same things too in terms of of, of vaccination. So I, I tend to be, even though I I do have reasons that I'm I am very interested in the idea of a vaccine passport. I think it has some potential to help build some to fill some huge deficits in public health infrastructure in the United States, particularly data infrastructure. I'm skeptical that it's going to have much, um, get, get much of a foothold here, um, may, maybe at the borders, people, and in part that has to do with our own kind of nativism and nationalism. We tend to see threats as coming at us from the outside, and that's part of the, that's part of our complex history in this country. Uh, perhaps domestic air travel in the United States. But um, if it is going to take hold, it's going to require, I do think it's going to require federal um, regulation and effort of, of some sort. And we've already seen the Association for State and Territorial Health Officers pushing back against the Biden administration that has said, hands off, I'm going to leave this to, to, to states and businesses and uh, your individual ingen ingenuity. But I do think it's going to take some, some federal effort. But if we look at things like the history of just vaccination registries in the United States, where there were efforts in the 50s, the 60s, the 80s, the 90s to, um, to create um, a to create federal registries of of vaccination, those those really all fell fell apart because of very deeply rooted skepticism on the on the part of uh, of a lot of Americans about government overreach, um, and not so much you know privacy is a concern, but we're also deeply skeptical of the idea of mandates and I have to do something, and so to the extent that we've been successful in this country in mandating things like vaccinations, it's been with kids, it's been with innocent victims, vulnerable populations, those who aren't perceived as being able to make decisions for themselves. But this idea that somebody, so Imogen, you, you talked uh, about a vaccine passport giving you something that allows somebody else to make, to decide for you based on a, on a choice that you've made. And that's that's the thing that Americans tend to be very skeptical about. I don't want somebody deciding for me. But at the same time, I would say that, that there is a, a degree to which you can provide for people too by building the infrastructure that really lets you connect connect health records, not just at the hospital system. We've made huge advances on that front in terms of electronic medical records, but in terms of a national health system that's interoperable and portable from one state to the next. Oh, that's that's super helpful, Amy. Thank you. I want to actually throw it to Ranjit um, to fill us in, Ranjit, on how, uh, on the work you've done in India studying Adahar. Can you give us a little bit of a background about what that is? and and how vaccination status will or won't be connected and, and what is different about the India context from all the other contexts we've already heard about? I think I'm gonna pick on something that Amy said, which is kind of centered on the idea of uh, thinking about this problem infrastructurally. So uh, to start with, uh, India has uh, for the last 10 years been investing in a biometric based national identification infrastructure. So uh, in 2010, the government started collecting fingerprints and iris scans of everybody in the country to give them a unique social security number, which is called an uh, Aadhaar number. Uh, Aadhaar is, uh, uh, translates to English to foundation. And, uh, you know, there is, there's quite a few, uh, you know, sets of issues that kind of have come up with implementation of the project as well. But what's important to note here is that uh, 
the people who designed Aadhaar are kind of using their expertise in being able to get a population of 1.25 billion people into designated facilities uh, as a resource to think about vaccinations. So uh, their argument, primary argument being that, you know, just like collection of fingerprints and iris scans, vaccinations require people to actually come to a place and get vaccinated, right? Uh, and that to a certain extent uh, can potentially be used as an organizing principle for not only distributing vaccines in the country, which uh, faces the challenge of scale uh, in terms of vaccinating 1.3 billion people, which, and you know, if you're doing vaccinations uh, that require two shots, that would be, you know, getting 2.6 billion, uh, you know, touch points uh, uh, in total. And that would basically mean that uh, what you're trying to do is to not only coordinate between a variety of different facilities that are providing these vaccinations, some of them are going to be uh, government-based, but others are going to be private. Uh, we are creating a new uh, you know, set of expertise in terms of vaccination itself. You know, we need, uh, uh, in India specifically, the requirement is of thinking through uh, you know, how many people are going to be vaccinated and who are these people who are going to vaccinate them. Uh, and so if you want to imagine it in terms of numbers, you know, uh, achieving a scale of 10 million vaccinations a day requires about 200,000 to 300,000 people who are doing the vaccination itself. And that to a certain extent is a massive challenge of scale. So in order to organize all of this, uh, the vaccine certificates kind of imagined as an organization principle. Uh, the core argument being that, you know, the vaccine certificate not only uh, can be used as an interface that kind of connects questions of who are the vaccinators, where are the facilities that are being you know that are being used for vaccinations? What are the payment methods that are used to uh, to vaccinate people? What are the vaccines that will be used to vaccinate people? And all of these have this one common thread of technology, which is basically the vaccine certificate that kind of connects all of this information together, which can eventually also be connected with uh, the biometric number. So uh, currently, what the country is doing, what the government is arguing, is that you know. If you, are, if you require a free vaccination and the government is subsidizing your vaccination, then you have to provide your biometric number in order to actually get access to uh, subsidized vaccines. Uh, if you want to basically just get it uh, from the market, which hasn't happened yet, you know, so we are currently in the phase of vaccine scarcity and, you know, we'll move to a place where, you know, the vaccines would be adequately available and anybody can just go to a hospital and get vaccinated. Uh, but that would happen, you know, uh, six months down the line or eight months down the line. And at that point of time, there would be private organizations which are also be involved in the distribution of vaccines themselves. So this is a larger challenge in terms of thinking about not only what are the use contexts in which vaccine certificates would eventually be used by organizations that are providing access to certain things uh, and whether people be, will be able to travel or not. It's currently imagined as a resource to actually put together a vaccination rollout program itself. Um, yeah. And that, to a certain extent, is uh, the larger challenge of managing scale of vaccine rollouts for countries such as India. Yeah, and, and I think something that I thought was really interesting, Ranjit, when we talked about this before, was this idea that the within India, the, um, the Aadhaar system is already interconnected with other things. It's already connected to the banking system. It's right. already connected. So the system on which this vaccine passport could be overlaid is already pretty, there's already sort of a, a use case and expectation in the context of people, for, for people who are enrolled in the system, which is, I think you said 98% of people in India. Right. Um, to have your personal identification information to be connected to other kinds of data about you. Absolutely, so absolutely. Uh, you know, so it started with the idea of uh, the biometric number being your financial address. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're basically thinking through cash-based subsidies, so, uh, you know, the government provides you with a certain amount of cash in order to basically then get uh, access to the kind of uh, nutrition that you would like to actually uh, eat on an everyday basis. Uh, for that, the government basically started using biometric numbers as a unique identifier for beneficiaries. And those numbers were supposed to be connected with bank accounts of people so that you know, the government can directly transfer money to the biometric number rather than the bank account. And so it kind of provides some amount of interoperability for uh, the beneficiaries on the, on the other end where they can choose which bank account uh, the subsidy amount goes to. And they can change, uh, you know, uh, their banking services depending upon how they're uh, actually interfacing with the government. 
but that to a certain extent is now uh, you know and again it's a way of basically saying this experiment is working and it's kind of designed around this whole idea and conversation around india stack which simultaneously is now currently being imagined as uh, a new resource to think through what would be called an india health stack uh, so you know as uh, emojen mentioned earlier this this town time bound crisis of covid is currently being used as a way of you know renewing certain amount of investment into building a unique health id for everyone in the country which would be the foundation for a health stack uh, which will connect medical records of people as amy was basically pointing out as a resource to infrastructuring health in india yeah. if if i could just add something on there so ranjit you said you talked about it being a way of of pushing out um vaccination reminders to people and that was that was the that was the idea and that is the idea behind vaccination registries in the United States you because the vax because the you know aside from covid and it could get pretty complex in, with with covid-19 too because two of our vaccines require that second booster shot we could see more booster shots coming into the future so having that infrastructure in place to be able to not count on people to remember but push out those reminders could be really important but we have to worry about the 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 power of push out versus keep out particularly in a country like like the United States where we have such inequalities that date back to the 1920s in terms of who has access to to vaccination and that is an amazing segue to sort of a next question which is you know what what are the potential what are the potential increases in inequalities that could come from from doing any kind of rollout poorly right so what what do we need to worry i know imogen you talked about the risks but are there some on the ground examples or particular cases either use cases where it's positive and it actually helps i think we've heard about creating a public health infrastructure that we lack and that we might want in in both india and the united states but are there other use cases where uh, we need to really be worried about that we should be thinking about in either context or any context i mean i can just mention one one point which is there's a really live conversation in the uk at the moment so the uk have set up a task force to look into this question there's um, a lot of calls from different actors about some form of this and an argument that really needs some wrestling through is the idea that you could use a vaccine passport to encourage uptake and i think there's kind of two hypotheses right you've got a group that perhaps are more vaccine hesitant if you link freedoms opportunities you know reintegration into society and and getting to go to bars or concerts or festivals that could provide a real incentive to people deciding to get the vaccine um there's a counter argument that i've heard as well which is that some of the groups who perhaps are most vaccine hesitant again maybe particularly in the uk context might be different in other contexts might be groups that have legitimate or historic anxiety about uh health interactions with their communities or about surveillance from the state so i think there is a an equal and important counter argument which says if you are building infrastructure around a public health measure that could actually act as a powerful deterrent against you know people wanting to get the vaccine and i think that is a really important kind those two hypotheses are really important to weigh and to consider in each country's context because it strikes me that will be very powerful in terms of the inequalities but also in terms of how it interfaces with the public health goal of vaccination which is obviously the the real priority for all countries at the moment Amy or Ranjit do you have any any sort of local con context um thoughts on on vaccine hesitancy and and its interaction Absolutely I think the simplest example here would be uh you know aadhar enrollment when it was happening in india was free and you know uh, you could basically just go to any organization whether it was public or private for enrollment and they they were supposed to basically just provide you the service without charging you any money but uh, on the ground uh, there were often enrollment agencies that were actually charging uh, you know people anywhere between 10 to 20 dollars uh, for enrollment uh, which kind of became a massive barrier for people who are who simply can't couldn't afford it uh so and that to a certain extent was a deep bone of contention in organizing our thalam government as well which uh the unique identification authority of india had to continuously blacklist organizations for doing this right and you can easily imagine this kind of uh, mapping on to a particular challenge when it comes to vaccine distribution where the government might say that the vaccines are free 
but uh, the uh, the people who are vaccinating the vaccinating facilities might charge money for it and uh, that creates an additional set of barriers around how these distributional logistics are actually created so while we may actually imagine that these organizational principles uh, would i would work really well in terms of uh, in theoretically but at the same time what happens on the ground is certainly very different and that to a certain extent created creates new set of challenges when it comes to how do we think through grievance redress or what does it mean to actually have due process in these situations where you know uh, i was promised a service but i wasn't offered the service uh, in the way that i was expecting it to be offered to me and what can i do in response in a way and that's an open question at the back yeah and i i would just add their building on imogen's comments and and rajit's um if you just even look in the united states about access to the vaccination you have to have a certain level of technology and um that's been one of that's been one of the barriers for some of the groups in the united states to to be to get vaccinated mm -hmm. um people who tend to have higher risk jobs don't have the ability to sit at a computer for an hour clicking to try to get that appointment uh, or or the the most likely not to get vaccinated the most likely not to have vaccine passports and they're the, the, those are the very groups that are highest risk that we do want to promote vaccination and, and and trust is one of the trust is one of the the key barriers with some groups in the United States and the United States too where one of our public health crises right now is the southern border um and we have to think about the 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 willingness of undocumented immigrants to to get vaccinated Texas other other southern states during the the 1980s 1990s have see pockets of of for instance measles outbreaks in in immigrant populations so we do have to build trust with with the groups who are who who are most likely to not get vaccinated and and going to be at higher risk from the consequences of covid-19 and i think the trust question is actually a really important point that in some ways so much of what's a challenge in the United States system is the lack of trust. You know, the people who, who are hesitant about the vaccine, people who don't want a national nationwide system because they don't trust the government. And my understanding, Ranji, is that this is quite different in India. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, part of the challenge of what I was studying when I was actually looking at uh, uh, Aadhaar was also this question of why did people choose to actually enroll into the project in the first place? And uh, the answers to the uh, to this question are kind of very varied because you know when the project actually began, uh, the designers of the project as well as the government were very were very unclear on why they were actually implementing a digital ID in the first place. It was supposed to not have a purpose because it was kind of done as a resource to basically then figure out uh, you know a sort of a root identity for people from which other identities could potentially connect. Right, it's a way of creating uniqueness of data records which then can transpire into uh, different data records that government holds on uh, at, for different services so it was not it was never specified that this is the reason why we are doing it but at the same time people chose to enroll into the project for prescient reasons like you know when we enroll into something that the government is doing we generally get a benefit out of it so uh, you know in a in a way there is there was certainly trust uh with the way in which uh, the government was uh if if looked at uh by indian citizens but at the same time it's, it doesn't mean that you know uh this trust is uh, universal so you know there were quite a few uh, th this point there was quite a lot of resistance to the project but at the same time as it increasingly became more pervasive uh you know we are living with this id system now so you know any form of resistance to uh, to it to a certain extent becomes becomes increasingly harder to actually pursue over time right so while you may say that you know you don't want to use an id in the first 5 years of its implementation as it increasingly gets appropriated by different parts of the government you know you have to have the id in order to actually interact with the government in the first place right so uh, you know it's an incremental process in that sense you know you have these early adopters it's like any technology right you have these early adopters and then there will always be late adopters for technology but at the same time uh, we have to think about it in terms of you know what is the threshold or a tipping point where you know if we have enough number of people who are invested uh, and have done this then it kind of changes the dynamics for the rest of the people and that tipping point is something that is an open challenge right now and how do we think about it is uh not only you know an open question for this panel i believe but also as a way of thinking about vaccine passports in general 
Hmm. Because, you know, you can easily imagine that, you know, two years down the line, there'll be a lot of people who have the past, uh, you know, this, uh, this form of certification as opposed to others who don't. And then the consequences of not having them kind of ramify over time uh, and can increasingly become a resource for getting them enrolled into the process as well. Mm -hmm. Just let me add, add one thing. Um, as Ranjit was speaking, one of the things that it's, I think it's important for us to keep in mind, and I, one of the reasons Ada Lovelace made the recommendation that even though there was a lot of skepticism, the governments need to take uh, responsibility here. Governments are accountable to citizens in ways that corporations are not. So despite that fear, um, there there is responsibility and accountability there. and. That's that's one of the reasons I would like to see to the I would like to see federal federal intervention in this area because I do think it's it's going to be inevitable in some fashion whether that's at the corporate level or because of what's happening globally and it would be it would be better for people we can elect to office and vote out of office to have some responsibility. Thanks, Amy. Um, I want to I want to throw out a question, which is I think we've heard from the Ada Lovelace um, process that we, we probably shouldn't, shouldn't be building, or maybe as of right now, based on the current evidence, should not be building vaccine passports. But we know that people are building vaccine passports, right? So knowing that, are there things that we should build into these passports, into the technical architecture to mitigate or reduce inequities that would arise from these? Are there things we can do or, or is, that, is that not possible? And I open this to anyone who wants to. Shall I, shall I jump in? It's a, I mean, it's, of course, it's a really important question. And actually, when we were doing the research, the, we've got a forthcoming report in a few weeks, which is the full kind of full final report from this. We are going to go a bit more into the technical side. But what we found when we were unpicking this is that, yes, there will be important technical principles around building this. Yes, it will be important to think about privacy preserving technologies and data minimization, um, the kind of challenge around interoperability with this, like the sorts of information you're gonna need, not just vaccinated or not vaccinated, but um, you know, when you were vaccinated, what the durability is, what the delay was between two doses, all these kind of, all these kind of questions that will need to be fed in. Actually, the, the real, um, I think, anxiety that arose from our conversations was not in the technical build, it was the socio-technical. Actually, unlike something like, I don't know, contact tracing apps, where there are really tricky technical challenges to try and work through there, the sense was that we are, you know, there are more and more tools that are actually thinking quite um, cautiously about how you build ID systems or how to kind of be quite privacy preserving. The fundamental purpose, I suppose, of a vaccine passport, and I'm using that word passport to indicate it comes with permissions or denial. You know, this isn't just the certification bit. This isn't just even the record. This is about how it's used. You can create something that's totally privacy preserving, but the harms, you know, privacy, like the harms can still happen because the harms might occur in the interactions between the actors that are policing that, that are permitting certain groups to do things that are, you know, potential employees asking for this information. And I think it's, it's about the socio actually more than the technical design questions. And that's one of the reasons that we really uh, wanted to push governments to say, you, you can't let this happen organically. You're gonna have to grapple with this question. And that might be saying it should go ahead or it shouldn't go ahead, but there's gonna need to be a lot of legal and policy design that goes around this for this not to create kind of harmful outcomes. So, and, I, and that I think really echoes Amy's point around governments have a responsibility to understand quite how powerful this could be in shaping society. And that has to be done consciously, that has to be done thoughtfully, and any harms have to be you know, addressed and ideally mitigated. We are actually um, right at when we were gonna shift to our question and answer period. And we have a lot of great questions. Um, and so I am going to, um, I'm going to dip into our Q&A here and see if we can find a good question. And this one is actually, this is from Angelina. Um, thanks, Angelina. Um, and it it actually ties into this last question. And it's it's a long question, so I'm going to paraphrase. Hopefully I'll do it appropriately. Um, but Angelina is asking about what, about sort of this data infrastructure and about the digital green certificate that the EU is proposing for travel this summer um, and saying, essentially, if there's, 
uh, globally a move towards interoperability on these passports, if that that get created, does it create the pat the potential for like a massive data infrastructure that could be repurposed for all sorts of different purposes? Is that a reason to come out against interoperability? Is Angelina's question? I mean, wow, that's a, it's a really good question. I think, and I think that's really the right place to to kind of lay some attention as well. So there's there's the kind of what goes into the technical build, there's the uses, but then there's also this question of what infrastructure are we building and what is the power of that infrastructure and how does that move power from some actors to other actors? And if this is going to have to, in some way, integrate with a national health record, if there is a national health record, thinking very UK parochial there, or integrate with a national ID system, of which we don't have in, in the UK, then actually what is that meta infrastructure you're building? And I think that is a really important question and an area of concern. So I think it's, really, it's a really good point to think about that additional layer of what is the system you're building really that draws on a lot of different countries kind of very powerful data information about their citizens. So let, let me add something here, and, and I think the infrastructure is the right, right way to think about it, and it does have a lot of dangers, and we don't do it lightly, but this is my vaccination passport from the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine I got yesterday. This is my original vaccination passport when I, so we haven't come very far, and and it's, and it's really important to understand for, for countries like the United States that that public health systems can still kind of exist in a technological backwater. There are places doing contact tracing on paper-based systems in the United States using Excel spreadsheets, and that's better than that's better than a you know a punch card. But um, we do have great systems of electronic health records, but we don't have that ability to share when somebody moves from one health system to another easily. And we really do, if if we're going to be thinking about national public health, global public health, we have to have a better handle on some of the challenges because what's not counted doesn't count. Just uh, to build on this, one of the things that I would say is that, you know, the question of interoperability is fundamentally a question of how the systems interact with each other, right? And we cannot potentially have a system which uh, which doesn't have built-in interoperability. Otherwise, you know, you're stuck in a system where you simply, it's like a conversation. You cannot talk to somebody else if you're not basically have the same foundation of having the conversation in the first place. What might be an important way of thinking about this would be to actually think about what is the data that is being stored and for what length is it being stored. So when we start thinking about uh, histories of transaction, we can easily imagine that, you know, while the transaction is happening, interoperability exists, but at the same time, you know, six months down the line, that the entire data set should not exist. And that would be a way of basically thinking through these particular challenges of trade-off between interoperability versus preserving privacy and surveillance. Because storage of data is a more challenging issue than interoperability, I would argue. Great. Our next question is from uh, Livia. And Livia asks, how do you see vaccine certification affecting the ability to become employed in certain industries being required by employers? Uh, it already is in the US by new hires in nursing homes, for example. I can envision this being incredibly different according to context and varying according to labor protections, union presence and labor histories. Um, I, I think that's, again, it's, I think it's a really important point. And actually, interestingly, um, when we were speaking to the German Ethics Council, it felt like employment was the one area where they really thought this is this is the crunchy issue. In the UK context, there's a lot of attention being given, for example, to, you know, you could have a you could have a cruise where um, all the passengers showed their vaccine certificate, or you could have a bar or a theatre where people had to do this. I think what is made less explicit is what does it mean for the people who are employed there? And in the UK, the vaccine is moving pretty much through the ages, right? So we're gonna have a real split between the 50s and overs and, and the under 50s very shortly. So I think that question of what does it do um, to employment in general, but really in particular, what does it do to those in precarious employment? What does it do to those who are unemployed? It feels like 
you know, there, there might be more protection or more thought put around kind of standard employment. It's those kind of, it's that tail of the population who are already facing potentially kind of poor working conditions. I think this could be extremely troubling. And I think it will be important to look at the existing legislation around employment, but also the kind of equalities angle on this. And again, I'm, I don't know about the US context for that, but in the UK, it feels like this is gonna bump up against some employment discrimination cases, particularly when it comes where you get kind of groups that may not access the vaccine overlapping with protected characteristics. So one example for that is around, for example, like pregnant women who aren't advised to get the vaccine. And that is a protected characteristic in the UK when it comes to employment rights. So I think that's a really, it's again, another reason that it would be good if governments were on the front foot about offering clarity about the legality and the legitimacy of any use cases, rather than leave this to permeate and then show up in courts or you know be challenged by people that have the resources to challenge it um, I think that's where we really need this stuff ironed out before rollout not not in the face of rollout just to build on this I would say that you know uh, when it comes to contact tracing for example uh, the the rules of engagement for essential workers is fundamentally different from other people right so if you're not an essential worker and you can work from home uh, the way in which uh, contact tracing works for you is it's different from if you are an essential worker and need to be out and, you know, uh, so it's, it's also a question of places and, you know, or what is the affordances and limits of your employment in terms of uh, thinking about, you know, the context of the use case itself that becomes important to consider here in terms of, you know, uh, if you are providing services that require you to constantly interact with other people, then the granular understanding of risk as the emergent put it earlier, uh, is different for you. And that to a certain extent changes the dynamics of what it would mean for you to not have a vaccine or choose not to have a vaccine vis-a-vis -vis other people who who might not face the same challenge. You know? That's a that's a that's a good point. And one of the uh, I don't know um, whether India requires vaccinations for adults, but in the US, the this kind of flips the model on its head because we have this long history of requiring vaccinations for school children to attend school. And of course, there, is, there, is a, there are always ways to ask for exemptions to, to vaccination requirements. And um, the same will be true for the, for the, um, for the COVID-19 vaccinations. Hospitals are one place that uh, provide an example of a, of a way forward. Hosp a lot of hospitals, if you look at flu vaccinations, nobody's gonna require them now while they are, under being distributed under emergency use authorization, but hospitals often require influence, seasonal influenza vaccinations, and those who don't get them um, have to wear masks. When I worked at Columbia Presbyterian for many years, you had to wear your ID card to get into buildings, and you got a green stick. It was like a vaccine passport. You got a green sticker on it, and you didn't get in unless you had the the green sticker uh, or a mask on. So, uh, and that's a that's a very specific kind of, of setting where you have vulnerable populations, but I do think we'll start to see it. I think we'll start to see it in places like universities where you have students living in congregate settings, but the, but the challenges are gonna be not so much with faculty and staff, they're gonna be dining workers, maintenance workers who are, who are gonna be most personally at risk, but um, are also gonna be um, parts of, of unions that are gonna be skeptical of mandates in, in part because of the ways, the implications that, that could have for, for, for time off and if you need to take if you need to take time off to get vaccinated so if if we're going to push forward with, with vaccination and mandates we need to do it in a way that makes it as easy as possible for that to to happen and reduce some of those barriers to the the idea of tracking because you you have easy access in the first place great so an anonymous attendee asks a question that's in fact quite related to what you were just mentioning, Amy, which is in the US we are seeing vaccination rates following lines of historical racial discrimination. Black and Latino populations are both most affected by COVID and the least likely to have been vaccinated. What are the risks of creating another form of redlining and discrimination by requiring a vaccine passport? Oh, it's a, it's an it's an incredible risk. And and that's this is another reason government needs to be involved even though government was was central to to redlining in in the in the first place in some in some fashion um, it's 
it, it's going it, to, we can't leave it to uh, uh, private, private interests to be making these decisions, but, uh, but that, would, that would be a huge argument against vaccine passporting, no question about it. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question, or, or maybe two, we'll see. Um, this is another anonymous attendee who has asked, what data do you think should be collected and stored? And where should the data be stored? Um, how secure should that information be? And who should have access to the data? And what's the potential for abuse? I think we've talked a little bit about this in terms of the sort of socio-technical being the big problems in the system. But um, are there particular ways to think about what data might be collected in this context or data that we shouldn't collect? I guess uh, just to start this conversation, I would say that you know one of the best practices here, especially in the context of contact tracing, have been that you, the data needs to be stored on the phone of an individual rather than it being stored in a cloud. Uh, and that to a certain extent allows for a certain amount of control, even in terms of the physicality of the data and where it's stored in, in a way. Uh, <clears throat> What sort of data uh, would be required is kind of dependent on uh, what is the minimum set of uh, you know data that is uh, that would that can be used uh, as a sufficient condition to identify someone while simultaneously know what their vaccination status is. So, for example, in India's case, specifically in the context of uh, the biometric data set, uh, one of the things that the designers were trying to do was to also point out that we don't need a lot of demographic data in order to uniquely identify someone if we have biometric data. So uh, the core demographic, uh, demographic data that uh, the biometric ID in India stores is name, age, gender, and address, uh, and that's it. Uh, beyond that, uh, you know, it, the, the data collected has iris scans and fingerprints, all 10 of them, uh, as a way of deduplicating uh, records uh, on the back end. So in a way, the demographic data that is required in order to basically identify someone uh, for this process might be minimal and could potentially be minimized vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the need for basically just knowing whether somebody is vaccinated or not uh, and which vaccination, uh, you know, which vaccination did they receive. And uh, the data collection should actually focus more on are there any side effects of these vaccinations? What was their, what was their experience uh, at the facility where they received the vaccination? Right, so it's most more of an evaluation of the vaccination experience itself rather than targeting an individual, because the the focus of this evaluation needs to be on the service that is being provided, as opposed to how much data can we collect on a person based on the service that we've provided. I could just um one add add one element in that I think is just worth picking out, and it also echoes um, some comments in the Q and A. Um, we're using vaccine passports as a bit of a shorthand and in different countries there's a great uh, emphasis on different aspects of this so I think the model under consideration in the UK is something that might include natural immunity antibodies so antibody test results might include vaccine status but it also might include test results now if you're bringing in test results that's obviously a very time sensitive thing uh, <laughs> Uh, that has very different kind of efficacy or accuracy rates. So I think thinking through what are the sort of data that you'd need to collect to make this work in terms of that. I think the you know, test results bring in a kind of big operational overhead because you have to build in all this information about something that probably is only valid for about 24 hours, 48 hours, right? As opposed to a vaccine. So it, it, in a way it minimizes some risks and another way it brings in operational overhead. I think on the flip side, some systems are thinking more about bringing in more health records, more personal characteristics that might have a very strong correlate relationship with risk when it comes to COVID. So that might include occupational setting, that might include health, that might include gender, that might include other historic illnesses. And again, you can see that building in that kind of information magnifies the risk, but it also potentially improves the quality of the model that you're trying to get to. And I think, again, this is where it just gets very thorny very quickly and where you're really going to need to think hard about the, the kind of legitimacy of the data you're collecting, whether or not you are building specific controls around scope creep, either for additional data or for uses at the other side. And also something that we are, um, something that we often call for ADA, but we're really, we're really focused on in this instance, that some of these trade-offs really deserve to be put to the public, that there will be trade-offs around this. This isn't something, you know, we had a phenomenal group of experts, but this isn't something that 
can be solved at an expert level in the same way it can't be solved at a technical level. This is something I think where you really need to bring publics along with you and you really need to engage with those groups who perhaps are going to face unique or adverse consequences or have a kind of a, a, a particular experience in this context, whether it's biometric IDs or health systems that really warrants additional attention. Great. I want to ask one last quick question This is sort of a lightning round. Um, if if there's a, a Matthew asks, um, is there a risk that if governments choose not to proceed with vaccine passports, that private companies will introduce initiatives, which we know they already are doing, um, that may raise ethical and privacy issues? And if so, what should governments consider in this case? So if governments are going to say, hey, I'm not going to be involved. Um, what do they need to, other policies that they should put into place? Is there regulation that makes sense um, that would help at least shape the private sector around this issue? Shall I um, kick, kick us off? Because uh, we have done some thinking explicitly about this. So yeah, a, a few things I think um, governments need to do, regardless of whether or not they themselves want to take this forward. Um, firstly, we would say set scientific preconditions you know, this has to be built on secure foundations. You need to be sure that it is going to work when it comes to transmission. It's going to tackle mutations. It's not going to have enough negative side effects that, say, encourage risky behavior because people think they're safe when they're not safe. So I think the set scientific preconditions is essential. I would say um, look at the specific use cases um, and I think what's been really interesting about this conversation is that Amy and Ranjit and, and myself we all, I think, lean into slightly different potential purposes for this. <laughs> and I think what's really critical is there are a lot of different purposes, a lot of different goals and a lot of different potential use cases. And I think it's really up to governments to decide whether any of those are valid. And if they are, to um, you know, ensure that they are building the policy and the legal infrastructure around those. I would say, you know, I already mentioned public deliberation. I think I already mentioned legal clarity. I think it's really important that some of these questions about discrimination when it comes to employment, some of that is up to governments to lead on. And then the last point I would say, and I don't know what the answer is because it's so rarely done well, we need to find a way to shut this down again. So if it feels like it's valid for the pandemic, but not forever, we need to think about what are the sunset clauses we're building in? Can we get the data back out again? Can we delete the data? Can we you know, render this technology obsolete? Or we need to be thinking very calmly and very creatively about what would it feel like right now if we weren't in the midst of the pandemic? What if we were talking about flu? What would we think was tolerable and what would we be comfortable with? And then we need to build those rules of the road, I suppose, around that scenario. So, so as, as I think about this, and I'll go back to where I started. And even though I see some potential for, for this idea to drive infrastructure that we desperately need in the United States around public health, I think the use cases are, are again, are going to be very limited. And I would look to the analogy of masking in the United States. There are some locales where masking is pretty uniform, but the challenge is enforcing it. And that's where I see it breaking down in the United States. Who you're going to ask the cashier at a at a at a grocery store to to enforce passporting, or you're going to ask somebody who's got an hourly job. You're going to ask an Uber driver to 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 do this kind of enforcement. So that's why I think it's that beyond some specific contexts, it's not going to be very it's not going to be very useful. But I do think it has the potential. To, and this is where, again, I worry about some of the disparities, looking at the history of, looking at our recent history of violence against Asian Americans, looking at our history of police brutality, you do worry about the ways in which citizen enforcement can uh, begin to spiral out of control in the United States. I completely agree with both Imogen and Amy. And the only thing that I would say and add is that, you know, if the government is not involved in the process, it needs to ensure that there is no denial of access. If people want to get vaccinated, uh, they should, and if they can't afford it, they should still have the opportunity to be vaccinated. And I think that's a perfect note for us to end on. Uh, thank you so much to panelists today, Amy Fairchild, Ranjit Singh, Imogen Parker. This has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. Um, 
I also want to say thank you to Eli and Rigo and CJ behind the scenes for making this uh, another wonderful DNS event. Um, to stay informed on upcoming research, um, you can subscribe to the Data and Society and Ada Lovelace newsletters. I believe links are going to be put in the chat for those who are interested in signing up. Um, again, thanks so much for joining us, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Mm -hmm.